Hello, all, and thanks so much for tuning in to today's program with Judy Battalion and Nancy Spielberg. Enormous thanks to the USC Shoah Foundation and to HMLA for co-hosting today. I'm Andrea Grossman, the founder of Writer's Block. We're here to learn about Jewish women resistance fighters and their extraordinary acts of bravery. The great thing about hosting an event with the USC Shoah Foundation is that they've got a treasure trove of testimony to accompany and amplify Judy Battalion's book. We'll start by listening to one of these women in Judy's book in a very brief clip as she describes some of these activities. Here's Vladka Mead. I would like to tell you how I escaped smuggling into the ghetto dynamite. It was on the point, the smuggling point of Platz Paresovsky, and it was a ladder put at the wall of one side, on the Polish side of the, uh, on the ghetto wall. I told by phone to, the, uh, to my group people, to the youth, where I am going to smuggle in. And this were packages of five kilo dynamite put in, in greasy paper to look like I am smuggling butter. I went up with my package. It was not suspicious for them. And while I was on top of the wall, shooting started. The foreman snatched away the ladder, and I was not able not to go back to the police side, and I didn't see anybody on the Jewish side. And I was afraid to jump, not knowing too much about dynamite, that maybe this could explode. The shooting came closer, and I was sure that I am done. But suddenly, the two people who were waiting saw me there on top, and they made a human ladder from the ghetto side and brought me down, and we ran away just in time. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Stephen Smith. I am uh, the executive director of USC Show Foundation. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, it's uh, amazing hearing Vladka Mead speaking because I knew Vladka when she was still alive. I knew her as an educator, as a teacher, as somebody who would sit in a classroom and talk about her life to the next generation, a generation that now teaches about the Holocaust to young people. Um, hearing her speak just now just reminds me of that um, amazing uh, archive that I have the privilege of overseeing at USC Shoah Foundation, founded by filmmaker and brother of Nancy Spielberg, Steven Spielberg, uh, in 1994. Those 55,000 testimonies, just like Vladka's that we just heard today, um, are used not only to um, document the past, but to speak to our present. And nothing more speaks to our present than the book that we're going to be discussing today. You know, um, it talks about resilience, humanity. It talks about overcoming the odds and being present in the world, defending what is right and yours to defend, but also being fully human and being very present in the world. And that's demanded of us today in many different ways. And so we're bridging past and future as we always do on a day-to-day -day basis at the USC Shoah Foundation. So delighted to be part of this with Writer's Block. Thank you so much for bringing us together, Anita. And also to give a real shout out to our partners in this, Holocaust Museum Los Angeles, HMLA. Thanks for all that you do throughout the year in our community and across our country to ensure that these stories are brought to the next generation of young people so that we can see and learn from them. Uh, it's a wonderful event to be part of today. Thank you for including us. Hi, everyone. My name is Marissa Lepore, and I'm a board member of the 3G group at the Holocaust Museum Los Angeles. 3G at HMLA is a community for grandchildren of survivors who are helping to shape the future of Holocaust remembrance and education. Our mission is based on memory, education, community, and social action, drawing on our own personal connections as stewards of our grandparents' legacies and the rich resources and support of Holocaust Museum LA. Holocaust Museum LA is the first and oldest Holocaust museum in the United States founded by survivors. Today, the museum provides free Holocaust education to students from across Los Angeles, the United States and the world, fulfilling the mission of our founder to commemorate, educate and inspire. Holocaust Museum LA will reopen to the public beginning July 1st. For more information about tickets, membership, and programs, like our weekly Holocaust Survivor Talks, please visit holocaustmuseumla.org. 
On behalf of Holocaust Museum LA, I want to thank USC Shoah Foundation and Writer's Block for their partnership in presenting what is sure to be a fantastic program. Thanks. Uh, Judy Battalion's new book, The Light of Days, reads like a thriller. It takes one's breath away. Through research that took years, Judy dug up journals, diaries, and documents in addition to conducting interviews all over the world with these bravest of women and their survivors. It was these ghetto girls who did the impossible. They stood up to Nazi soldiers and officers in the face of certain death. They lied, they stole, they forged, they blew up buildings and trains, they spied, they created false identities, smuggled guns, knives, and food, and they killed Nazis. Many of these young women knew that they had no choice if they wanted to cheat their certain destiny. Battalion's impressive scholarship is one thing. She's unearthed a host of buried stories that shed light on women and girls in Hitler's ghettos. But it's her storytelling that's so noteworthy here. She plunges the reader into the exploits of these women, many of them teenagers. The tension and risk are palpable on each page. This book is one of the most inspiring and astonishing chronicles of collective courage I've ever read. I urge you to go to our website to find the link to Chevalier's bookstore where you can get signed book plates for Judy Battalion's book, The Light of Days. Much of the action in this book takes place in and around the Warsaw Ghetto. This is familiar territory to Nancy Spielberg. She's the executive producer of the great documentary, documentary Who Will Write Our History, which explored the secret archives of photos, posters, and accounts of how people lived and how people died in the Warsaw Ghetto. She's also the producer of other documentaries, including one on Jewish American GIs in World War II and another on the search for Nazi war criminals. If you have questions that pertain specifically to this program, just use your Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to type in your question, and we'll try to address them. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Judy Battalion and Nancy Spielberg. Do I have Judy there? I'm here. All right. Hi. Hello. Hello. Thank you all so much for, for having me and for this. What an incredible introduction to the book. And, and thank you to all these host organizations and to everyone at home uh, watching on Zoom. Thank you for being here this evening. And I am thrilled that I'm honored that I was chosen <laughs> to speak to you. And it's funny because I didn't even realize that I know your brother. Of course, you know my brother too, but you know, you <laughs> we didn't have that discussion. And I was like, I know Ellie Battalion. I didn't put two and two together. And of course, he's a comedian. And I'm reading this book of yours, and I'm thinking, uh just I was so overwhelmed with this story. And I understand from your introduction that you really didn't set out to write this book. I mean, this was uh, there was a path that you took, and it was over 10 years. And you found yourself doing making this project, which is so dense. Tell us what happened to you. How did that happen? What happened to me? I, <laughs> I, I often wonder that as well. Um, sure, I will tell you the story of how this book came about. Um, so long story. So so settle in. This this book started 14 years ago, um, and honestly, it started by accident. I was living in London at the time. I, um, I was thinking, it was a time in my life where I was thinking a lot about my Jewish identity. I am the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. But I was thinking about what I call the emotional legacy of the Holocaust. I was thinking about how trauma passes over generations. I am, believe it or not, a very anxious person. And it was a time in my life where everything felt very dangerous to me. And I started wondering, you know, how much has my Holocaust heritage shaped how I perceive, how I react to everyday dangers? And I decided to write a performance piece about this. I was also doing comedy at the time. I used to be funny, not anymore. <laughs> but um, so I started writing a performance piece about danger. And I wanted to write about strong Jewish women who had confronted danger. And I wanted it to have like a historical spine. And the first woman I could think of who fit this description was Hannah Senesch. Um, for those of you who don't know who she was, 
Hannah Senesch was a young Hungarian Jew who made Aliyah. She moved to what was then Palestine in the 1930s. She was a poet. She was a writer. She was a lyricist. You, you probably know her songs. Um, but during World War II, Hannah Senesch decided she wanted to fight back. She joined the Allied forces. She became a paratrooper <laughs> and volunteered to return to Nazi-occupied Europe to fight the Nazis. She was caught actually very early on, but you know, legend had it, she looked her executioners in the eye when they shot her. I, I studied Hannah Zanish in fifth grade and I'd always sort of grown up with her as this image, a, a, um, a symbol really of Jewish bravery, of Jewish pride, of Jewish courage. But back 14 years ago, I didn't wanna know about Hannah Zanish the hero. I was really interested in Hannah Senesch, the person. Like, who does that? <laughs> who chooses right. to go fight the Nazis? What is the psychology behind that? What, it, what motivates that kind of audacity, that boldness? I, I wanted to find a nuanced biography about Hannah Senesch, someone who had really explored her, her person, her personality. That led me to the British Library, where I typed in Hannah Senesch in the catalog and ordered what they didn't have very many books about Hannah Senesch. So I just ordered whatever they had. And one of the books that happened to come back in the stack was an unusual book. I was the first one I picked out and it was an old book. It had yellowing pages. It was dusty. It had a blue fabric cover with gold writing. And it was also in Yiddish. It was called Freuden in die Ghettos women in the ghettos but even more unusual than the book is the fact that i speak yiddish <laughs> so i start looking through this book looking for the hana senish but i can't even find her she's in the last 10 the last chapter in front of her are 175 pages of small yiddish tags listing dozens and dozens of other young Jewish women who fought the Nazis and primarily from the Polish ghettos with photographs of them and little obituaries and bits of writing and snippets and memoirs in chapter titles like ammunition, weapons, um, partisan combat. There was a, a, an ode to guns. And this, it stunned me. It was so different in content and in tone than any Holocaust narrative I, I'd ever encountered. It was nothing like any story I'd grown up with. And, and that's where it all began. <laughs> and, and really, it, it took, you can see how long this project took just by looking at how detailed and dense. The notes in the book are like a hundred and something pages. I mean, some people don't read the notes you, of a book. You don't book, need to read the notes. Yeah. But I loved reading the notes <laughs> because actually, and, and I imagine you, as does USC Shoah Foundation and the Holocaust Movement and Writer's Block, we take on the tasks, and I do with my documentaries, to be 100% accurate because you have created another archive that, that will be where we move forward with these stories. So accuracy must have been a huge challenge. I even noticed in some of your notes that you said that you had one person even give two different accountings, and then you had a couple people say different things about the same date, and you had to research a ton of people to get to the truth. What Did that happen often that you found conflicting reports? I mean, I my primary source material was personal testimony. It was memoir. It was written memoir. It was oral memoir, video. It was family talking to me. Um, and But it, it was a first person accounts. It, some of them were written more recently with um, written with scholars, written with professors, experts in Jewish history. Some of them were written in 1944. Even in 1943, they were written during the war. Wow. Some of them were written right after the war. So it was a huge um, collection of first person accounts, but these accounts did have varying details. Some of them on one page, it was November on the next page, it was December. Right. These were written during the war people, you know, they were written in different environments with different 
you know, degrees of fear and passion and the need to write it down. Some right. are written later with more reflection and, and, and a, a different tone. Um, so I, I was, you know, I was very, very conscious of accuracy. And that is why I have all those footnotes because I wanted to explain, okay, I, I had to make a judgment as the writer, as the historian that, okay, I'm going to go with this version of the events, which seems the most plausible to me, but there are other versions. And I did want to, to express that. Um, but what was very exciting, what was very exciting was not necessarily just the discrepancies. It was the overlaps. Uh -huh. it was when I found one testimony and, you know, you're reading through or listening to hours of this or hundreds of pages and, oh, the story, oh, wait, Tuesday in Sosnovich? Wait, Ira, uh -huh. he talked about that too. Oh, wait, that, someone else talked about that. And it actually made it feel very real. Very authentic. And, and yeah. Very authentic. I right. knew that event happened on Tuesday in that town. And, you know, even if the reports of the event were understandably different in the different accounts right, right there was actually a feeling of oh well this this must you know this really everyone talked about that day and you have a lot of characters and and I'm glad because you know some of the uh the dialogue what we know of the holocaust many times I mean if we know of women in the holocaust and Frank and Hannah Senesh like what you said I mean the general population does not know about women and I think most of the time resistance women resistance is really the wives of the resistance, you know, and they're the ones supposedly cooking and bandaging. And this is a whole nother world. So in all of those characters and we, there's a lot, and then there's the ones that we really get to know. Well, you have to have a favorite. Uh, Come on. You have to tell us who's your favorite. and Why was it because you got into the writings, the mindset, did you see uh, testimonies, visual testimonies? What, was it the chutzpah? Who was your favorite? You can't have a favorite child. Yes, you, well, can. you can't. You just admit can't tell the other one. You can't admit to it. <laughs> right. Um, that is a that's a tricky question, and I think that I had a few favorites. Am I allowed to say that? Yes. Um, and do you and have pictures of any of these more favorites that you can share with us? Because that's me, sort of that's a great you. idea. Let me share. Let's hope the technology works. And there we go. All right, so this is one of my favorites. Um, her name is Frumka Plotnitska. She is second from the right, and she is wearing that coat with that amazing fur collar. I'm very into the fashion at this time. Um, <laughs> Frumka, um, Frumka Plotnitska was old for the cohort that I'm writing about. She was 25 when the war began. She was already a leader in the Jewish youth movements in Poland. This is a picture of her youth movement in 1938 in Bialystok. Um, in 39, the youth movements, everyone was told to run east. Um, in fact, that's how my grandparents survived as well. She went east, she crossed over to, um, she's actually in Belarusian territory near her parents' home. She was safe for now, but she couldn't take having fled. It just didn't suit her. So Frumka was the first leader to smuggle herself back into Nazi-occupied Poland. She went to Warsaw and became, stayed a leader, became a leader in the Warsaw ghetto. Um, she helped run large scale soup kitchen. She negotiated with the Jewish government, the Nazis, the Polish government. She helped get fellow Jews out who they'd been arrested for forced labor. She helped get them. She helped feed people and find housing. She was known as the Mame, the mother in Yiddish, in the ghetto. She was in her about 26 at the time. During this time, she realized it wasn't just Warsaw that was important. She had to keep the country connected. She put on makeup, even though she was against makeup, and a handkerchief on her face, and traveled through Poland, giving seminars and lectures in various ghettos in Poland. She was one of the first people to smuggle weapons into the Warsaw Ghetto when the underground became more of a militia. She um, brought two guns, and she hid them in a sack of potatoes under the potatoes. 
She then was sent to this town of Bijin in southwest Poland, where she led the underground and she led the revolt. And I, I usually don't like giving away the end, but with Frumka, it's so important. She, she was killed and she was killed fighting from a bunker, shooting Nazis. Um, and she was killed while doing that. And after wow. the war, she was awarded a um, medal from the then Polish government for her military service. Wow. And I don't think we've remembered her. Right. And so that right. is from, also I should say something, you asked who's my favorite. And in many ways, I felt connected with Frumka. She was someone who, she was very, she was very shy. She, um, she had trouble, her, her friends talked about this in pieces they wrote about her after, after her death. That she, she had trouble maintaining friendship. She was very introverted. She, she, you know, she was quite what we might call neurotic. She was very internal. Um, and, and she had, she, you know, her tale during the war, she was a leader, but she wasn't, she had breakdowns. She had difficult times. She had times where she wanted to just quit and walk away and kill herself. And she managed to, to push on, but, um, Wow. Yeah. Did you find that? Um, and I think I, I read that Renya, and oh, the, one of the main next. characters, that she had said at one point she was so mentally and physically broken that she wanted to kill herself. And then she was ashamed of herself for even uh, entertaining the thought because she would not help the Nazis with their task. Why should she? Is that something common in some of the writings that you found this despondency, resignation, and then, you know, a rejuvenation of, of the will to keep on fighting? This was constant there, you know, then part of the, this is Renya, by the way, oh, Renya is stunning. Her. look at her. Wow. Part, this is her in 1944. Um, part of what really drew me to these stories was that they were they were very real. They were very honest. They ran the gamut of emotions from, they weren't just, you know, heroes going out to fight. They were also depressed and they were also terrified and they were also debating what to do and what choices to make. And it made them feel very, very real to me. They were, they came alive to me. And right. that's really what I wanted to share with my, with my readers too. Um, I found this one you ask particularly about that I found so there's this one diary that was written by um, her name was Gusta Davidson she was a leader of the Krakow underground and she was arrested and she was taken to a Gestapo prison in Krakow she was tortured um, but she decided she had she was a writer before the war and she decided she had to chronicle what happened in the Krakow underground and she um, wrote a diary. She had, there are a few other Jewish women in her cell and they used to surround her to sort of hide what she was doing. They had smuggled in pencils from non-Jewish prisoners in their cell who gave it to them. They wrote it on toilet paper and they used um, fibers from their skirts to sew the toilet paper together. Oh and they, and sometimes she couldn't even write because her hands were so, um, her fingers were hurt in the torture. So someone else would write and she would dictate. And they made five copies of this diary chronicling the Krakow resistance and hid it in the, in the, they hid them in various locations. And one of them was found after the war. And Gusta did not survive, but her diary did. And this diary, is, she's, she's so smart and it's so, it is, both a narrative account, but it's also a very a psychological reckoning. It's a consideration of who, who, how people felt, why they acted, why they acted, even why the Nazis acted, why they acted. And she too she talks about this experience of the youth of the time. And that she, the cohort that I write about, these women were 18, 19, 20 years old, and they became orphans. Their parents were killed. Their families were killed. And the grief they felt was enormous. And she writes about how the underground and the work of the underground really helped channel the grief and into activity. Um, was that also with, I noticed, I mean, there's a lot of sure. youth movements that seem I'll to become the adopted families and the comrades. Um, and is that where, like, you think of these young women 
who, you know, they went to school and they, they could talk fashion. All of a sudden they're out there and they're learning how to make bombs and they're learning how to fight. Did that come through like the kibbutz movement or the Hashomer Tzair? And, and did that replace their families? I mean, when, when some of them watched the, and, and they, you know, couldn't even react or respond or save any of their families as they watched them go off, was this what they did? Did they prepare to fight through these youth movements? Okay, so let me backtrack a little bit and talk about my new obsession, Poland in the 1930s, um, which is such an interesting period that I, I'll come back to. Poland in the 1930s, Jewish youth was really organized by youth movement. 100,000 young Jews were, part, were members of youth movements. These youth movements were often affiliated with political parties. They were value-driven. They were political. Um, and they were like the scouts. So I was saying about more so. If you right. see pictures, they're often wearing, some of them they're wearing, the, even the ties. But they were, they were intellectual, they were social, emotional, spiritual training grounds for young Jews. And the movements that I focus on in my book, the, the, the women I focus on were largely from socialist, secular youth movements. Some of them were Zionists, some of them were Bundists, they were labor socialists were not Zionists, they were diasporists, um, but they were largely the social secular. And so these were very much their political and value driven groups that believed in Jewish pride, pride in their heritage, pride in their history. They, the pursuit of truth comes up all the time. They were egalitarian, women were leaders. I showed you that photo of Frumka. She was a leader in 1938 in the movements as they called it. Um, they were also socialists. So they collectivity, collaboration, they read psychoanalysis, psychology. They talked about how to work together. They were very emotionally aware. They discussed their strengths, their weaknesses, how to communicate. They had leadership structures in place and they analyzed them and talked about them. They believed in self-sufficiency. They, you know, they, and so, and for many, for the Zionist groups, especially, I had no idea about this. They, many of these youths left their family. This is before the war and moved into communes or kibbutzim that were located all across Poland. Wow. And they, so these groups, they developed incredible bonds. They knew each other very well. They lived together. They understood how to work together. They talked about how to work together and they were already politically driven and, and, and motivated by Jewish pride. And it is these groups that in the ghettos became the fighting cells. Right, right. And I, I think it's because they were not, the groups themselves were never set up to fight Nazis. Um, they were set up to promote Jewish identity and culture, um, and some of them to prepare for life in, in, in to make Aliyah, um, and some of them not, some of them for life in Poland, but they, they were not set up to be antagonistic at all. They, they even write about this in their memoir. You know, we were, they were hippies, if we were going to use a contemporary <laughs> term. They had, you know, sing-alongs, and they said we were a groups of Homsitz. creation. Yeah. Homsitz. They became groups of destruction, right. but they wow. were primed to do that because of how they were structured and 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 the values that they that they that they trained in and these and and the girls are between 15 and what well, you said 25 was old for the group i yeah. mean it's really hard to imagine when you were that age or i was that age how we would have reacted so and you know of course this when you open the book there's a cast of characters so this the, the narrative is so vivid. The details are so wonderful. It, you, I see the big screen. I mean, it screams movie. And by the way, I think at least five or six people said, Nancy, you have to make a documentary. And then I found out this guy with my last name <laughs> is working on it, on the film. I'm still trying to get the doc. Um, are you excited about that? And what do you, I mean, what do you really hope? Like, what are you excited about seeing this get to a big screen? I mean, I, I guess it would be very exciting, and and I've been working um, co-writing a screenplay. It's you know, it is a very cinematic and dramatic yes. story. I mean, you know, even when I would read these memoirs, I, I I was hanging off the page for some of that. I mean, 
I mean, they're really very dramatic and there's some, you know, beautiful moments of, you know, especially women, they're performing, they're in disguise. There's one moment where they poof extra smoke from a train so the women could hide in the smoke. I was like, that's already a movie. You don't need it anything is, else. And, um, but, you know, in, in its cinematic stunning potential is this horrid, horrid truth. And, uh, you know, and sometimes it's the kind of book that when I read it, I sometimes had to take a breath. I literally had to sort of push it at arm's length. And then I would pull it back, just I had to breathe. And here you did something which is probably behind what Shoah Foundation and the Holocaust Museum and Writer's Book really want is to bring young readers in. And you made a young readers edition. How do you do that when you've got some really violent, difficult scenes? How do you handle that for the young readers? So the Young Readers Edition, that's the blue, the blue book one. behind me. And that's intended for ages, they say 10 to 14, um, though it definitely requires a knowledge of the Holocaust. It, it doesn't explain what the Holocaust is or was. Um, it was the publisher's idea to do this. But as soon as they suggested it to me, I thought, I mean, of course, what, what it, when I started this, what, what inspired my whole book, Hannah Senish. When did I learn about Hannah Senesh? In fifth grade. It's exactly the time to learn and teach about, about these incredibly brave, resilient, intelligent, courageous Jewish women. And so I, but I worked with someone who specializes in writing for that age group. Right. Um, and in a funny way, I was more anxious than the children's team was. I was like, wow, are they not going to understand? It's me too traumatic. It's me too. And, and, you know, a lot of times it was sort of came back to me and feels like, you know, Judy, they, actually children do understand and they can take in a lot and I, a lot more than I had given them credit for, I think. Right, right, right. Um, but, but it's tough. Listen, it's, it's uh, how you even manage to read and immerse yourself in the stories. When my brother was filming Schindler's List at the end of a filming day, he was so despondent. So it was so difficult and so dark that he would go home. And the only thing that would raise it, Robin Williams used to call him and just do a 20 minute monologue to lift his spirits. Who lifted your spirits? Were you able to pull yourself out of this? Were you completely consumed? Or were you able to go home and you gave birth to three kids in the, in the time you were working on the book and hug your kids and wipe their mouths and put yourself in present day because this was the, this is some difficult reading. Um, yes, Robin Williams didn't call me for this. I could have <laughs> used it. The late Robin Williams. You could have asked your brother, you know. <laughs> or, no, it, yeah, it's tough. I mean, just you, had a, you need mental health days in the middle of this work. You must have had to. You know, partially, that, I mean, that's why it took me so long. Right. It, I didn't work on it yeah. full time for 12 years. Right. I mean, I worked on it in, in fits and starts. And especially the first 10 years, without exaggeration, were, you know, a few weeks here, a, few, a month there, I focused. Another thing, oh, I did that. Oh, and then, uh, so it, it wasn't, and, and that's because it was so emotionally difficult, especially right. when I was younger, it took for me to be a little bit older and a little bit more settled to really get into the story. And right. I did have my own, you know, it's funny because I have a lot of friends who work in, in social justice and in, in, in difficult as, as social workers. And they have, you know, group therapy sessions often. They're organizations, they're with other people. They have that, that support. I'm just by myself as a writer. Right. So I don't, I don't have that kind of institutional support. Um, but I, I had to find ways in my life to, so for instance, I, I started doing work in, in, New, in New York um, at the library at the Center for Jewish History, which is an amazing, beautiful library. And they have, so many of the books that I needed and sources that I needed, but I actually was, I actually found it too difficult to be in that environment. And I had to switch my workplace to like a shared office space with people working in the fashion industry. Right. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding because right. it like, it, it balanced it out yeah. for me. Yeah. So, 
you know, and, and you, you know, you spoke about, I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit. You spoke about, you were originally doing stand-up comic. I mean, that was one of the things you did. And that actually helped you with some, dealing with some of the issues you had with Jewish identity and self-consciousness. And these women are all in performances. When you read how they had to be Catholic and they had to learn how to, when to bow and how to cross themselves, or they had to be Nazi sympathizers. They had to live in the Aryan world. They didn't get an intermission. They didn't get a coffee break. I mean, how intense is that to, to have to, sh again, I, if it maybe I don't know if it was Renya that watched her family be taken away or killed and she could not blink and could not cry. How did they, after the war, how did they function? Did they, were they able to shed this, these, these uh, personas, these roles, which obviously they didn't need anymore, but they were so used to not being themselves and hiding emotions. Were they able to, to let their hair down and live their lives after the war? Yeah, it's, I mean, you've just said so much. I've like 20 different responses. I, I mean, yes, these women, women did this work on the outside and they performed many women in the underground, they did work on the outside, outside the ghettos, outside the camps, pretending to be Christian, pretending to be young right. Catholic Polish women. I, in fact, I can pull up some photos if you want. I can yeah. tell, let me show, show some more photos because I, found, I have photos of them. Yes, pretending. we want to see. <laughs> um, so this is Renya. Okay, so maybe I'll tell, um, let me tell this story because uh, this is a great character through which we can address some of these questions. This is the story of Bella Hazan. And well, this is one of my favorite, you asked one of my, this is one of my favorite stories. She, one of them. So Bella is the one in the middle. Bella was tall and blonde and she looked good. They used to say she had a non-Jewish look. She was part of the underground from the get-go. And because she looked good, they wanted her to do work on the outside, outside the ghetto. So they asked her to move to the town of Grudno. And she moved to Grudno pretending to be a young Polish woman. And she had to find uh, a place to sleep. She had to rent a room in a woman's apartment. And, it, and then she had to find a day job because it would look unusual if she didn't have a job. Every element of their life was performed. They were afraid to fall asleep in trains in public. What if they mumbled in Yiddish in their sleep? There was no wow. moment where they could where they could break character. This was life or death performance. And so she goes to the local employment office in the town and applies for a day job as a Polish, a young single Polish woman would do. And they say, oh, we have the perfect job for you. Um, you can work at the Gestapo. So she gets a job being a receptionist at Gestapo headquarters in Grudno. And in here, she, she brings them tea. She does some translation work for them. She's, a, she's an office girl, um, but she also steals their documents. And she takes the documents, Aryan papers, Aryan passports, stamps, and she brings these to the Vilna Ghetto, to the underground, and gives them to these makeshift like Jewish forgery labs where they could make fake papers for, for people in the underground to go on missions. And they would just provided them. Sometimes they sold them to other Jews in the ghetto, fake Aryan papers. So that was part of what she did. She also ended up smuggling bulletins and she used to hide them and braided in her hair <laughs> um, and weapons across the country. Anyways, in the Gestapo office, one of the men who works there, develops a crush on her, she's very pretty. And he invites her to the Gestapo Christmas party. And again, she can't say no because any, any iota of suspicion is life-threatening. So of course, of course she'll come to this Christmas party. Um, that night, it happens that two other of these Jewish underground operatives, other couriers who were smuggling weapons, Lanka Kajabrotska here on the right and Tema Schneiderman on the left were staying in her room while oh they God. were crisscrossing the country. So she had, and, and she's living with a landlord. So what story, she get into the store. So she says, well, come with me. We're all going to the Gestapo Christmas party. Oh my God. This photo was taken at the Gestapo Christmas party in Grodna in 1941. 
In fact, Incredible. this photo ends up getting her caught. It, I don't want to give away too much, but this photo is found on one of them. They end up catching Bella because she appeared in this photo. They knew someone else was Jewish anyways. Oh, I mean, not Jewish, wow. part of the underground. In fact, this yeah. is what my point I was going to make to bring it back. She gets caught. She gets sent to Paviak prison in Warsaw. She gets sent to Auschwitz. But the whole time, she maintains this fictional performance that she's Catholic. So through she goes through Auschwitz as a Catholic, and she can't tell anybody who she is. And all she she writes about this, all she wants, she needs someone to know who she is. The desire to be known for her real name is, is overwhelming for her, but she she cannot break character through the through death marches and 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 I don't want to, anyways, I don't want to give it away. Incredible. But saying, Just yeah. incredible. Would do you have any more pictures? Because I have one or two more questions, then we're going to open it up for uh, um, some other questions. Any other que Any other pictures? So here, this was just an example. So this is Vladka Mead, who we saw Vladka, in the yes. video in the beginning. And this right. is her in central Warsaw in 1944. Wow. And she is pretending to, again, to be a young Catholic woman. Usually they pretend to be a day, a day out for theater, a day out for... At this point, there was no more Warsaw ghetto, so she wasn't smuggling weapons into the ghetto, but she was doing rescue work. Rescue right. organization helped hers helped 12,000 Jews in hiding, just hers in Warsaw alone. She would find Jews hiding spots. She would pay off the hiders. They used to write in their memoirs, they write about their bags, the handbags were filled with cash. <laughs> and they would go around and they would pay off the hiders they would find medical help. They would find trusted photographers to take photos of Jews in hiding for fake papers to help them get out. She would bring them, if she could find a book or a piece of paper to, to draw on some spiritual help as well, she would just visit them and, and you know, be, say hello, acknowledge them as people. She, you know. Incredible. I, you know. Let me ask you a question. Sure. How many of the people that you portray in the book were you able um, to see visual histories from Shoah Foundation or Yad Vashem testimonies or Holocaust Museum testimonies? Were, were you able to, or did most of the information come from the memoirs and the things that they had wrote early on? Were you able to see, I mean, besides Vladka that we saw before, um, were there other testimonies that you were able to watch of some of these people? I, I had, I mean, I had tons of, I mean, it's funny because when I went out to pitch this book at the beginning, my, my agent was worried, is there gonna be enough? Is there gonna be enough primary <laughs> documents? Like right. three weeks into the writing, I was like, there's more than I can ever even read or listen to, let alone be enough. There were so many testimonies, oral testimonies, video testimonies, memoirs, writings, letters. Um, and I, why I, didn't we know about this? You know, why is the resistance story, why is the women, resistance story one that is just not known um the focus was on the men so i'm so i mean we're all so this is what everybody is grateful to you for bringing all of this to light but but why wasn't it discussed earlier so you're asking me this question that with two minutes to go and this yeah, is I like know. a four so hour maybe Zoom. that's just going to be the rhetoric question or unless you have an idea uh, an answer of, of why I'm going to do it in a quick way. So this question became the sub question of all my research. On the one hand, what happened? What's the story? And on the other hand, what happened to this story? Right. How could I not know this? Right. It, it doesn't even make sense. And we're not talking about one or two people. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of young Jewish women involved in this underground. And there are two underreported stories here. One is Jewish resistance in general, especially in Poland has been really under discussed mm -hmm. and the other is women's experience in the holocaust until recently has also been under discussed and here we have a story of women in the resistance in poland and some of the reasons of this you know long silencing some of it and i get and i do get into it in the book in much more detail but I, you know some of it is political and it has to do with how narratives of the holocaust were really shaped by political forces we can right. see that now in poland 
Um, some of it is zeitgeist. And, you know, we were just interested in different elements of the Holocaust at different times. And we've also been uncomfortable talking about different elements of the right. Holocaust at different right. times. And Which you of- also cover in the book, you know, of uh, sexual abuse. It was not something that the women were quick to talk, talk about. about. Right. But some of, and some and, of it and, exact. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. And some I was of the say some of it was just that the women didn't talk about it, or they talked right. about it and then stopped talking about it. And some right. of that is because they weren't believed. They were accused of sleeping their way to safety, of leaving their families to join the resistance, of running away, of um, collaborating. Some of them felt they had tremendous survivor's guilt and they right. felt that compared to their peers, their survivor peers who had been through Auschwitz, they hadn't had it that bad. Yeah. And they write about that. They didn't feel they merited telling their story, um, even though their stories were extremely traumatic as well. Right. Um, right. And for well, we, many of them, they just wanted to start fresh. Right, right. Like, well, I heard, Liz, I'm hearing that we have some great audience questions. Okay. So you're not <laughs> off the hook. You're off the hook with me, but now you're going to have better questions coming through. So I think Amy's going to help us with some audience questions. Good evening, everyone. Um, I've been tracking, there's been some lively um, Q&A that's come up. So we'll kind of just start and go through the list as best we can and, and get through we can in the time that's left. We've got about 12 minutes here. So um, Catherine Funk asked, um, I noticed that multiple of the women you focused on in this book found fashion important. You think that their fashion played a role through the war and their accounts, either as something to help them achieve their goals or something that brightened their day in some way? That is a great question. And could also be I'm a little obsessed with their fashion too so I brought that out but yes fashion was a big part of the story first of all fashion in the 1930s was it was part of the I I didn't get a chance to talk about this there's so much but the 1930s in Poland was a time as I mentioned Jewish women were leaders in these youth movements they were also educate they were the 1930s Poland was counterintuitively I think progressive especially for women. Jewish women were educated. Jewish women went to university. Jewish women worked. Um, 45% of the Jewish labor force in 1931 was women. Um, And part of this was also fashion and their fashion changed. And they write a lot about this. And, you know, they had cropped haircuts with barrettes and fitted blazers and skirts were shortened and heels were were made low and thick. And this was fashion which allowed them to move, to walk, to run. And I do think that was an important part of their roles. If they had dressed differently, they wouldn't have been able to carry out the kind of work that they did. Um, And then in the get, I mean, these were women who were going undercover. They were disguising themselves as young Catholic women. And they, they that there was a certain look they were going for. And they talk a lot about the clothes and borrowing the clothes and trying to find the clothes and fitting into the right clothes and, and even, you know, finding the right fashionable handbag that's gonna enable them to fit in. And that's what they end up, you know, stuffing the guns into. Um, but yes, this was very important because they were acting and they were playing a role and, and wardrobe was important. It also made them feel the part. Okay, changing gears a little bit. Um, Rahel Kaufman asks, I'm wondering about Judy's writing journey. Was there a writing course she took that you would recommend for aspiring writers? <sighs> I've taken many writing courses over the years. Um, and I mean, I've been writing for a very long time and this isn't my first book. And every journey I've taken has been all, all over the place and exceptionally non-linear. Um, I don't know that there's a specific class. There are certain teachers I've worked with. Um, sometimes I, I, I mean, this is a lot long, long longer time ago um i've had i worked with a writing coach about 10 15 years ago who helped me shape some ideas um and who like taught me about pitching um writing so 
there have been different people over the years who's also, I was trained as a historian. I didn't even talk about that. I was doing comedy history, program, but I actually have a PhD in history, in art history. And I worked for many years. My day job was in museums and I did detective work and research. And, and so a lot of that training really came into play in writing this book. Um, but if you want to contact me, I can, we can, I, can, I can put you in touch maybe with some writing teachers that might be appropriate if I know what you're looking for. It's very generous, thank you. Um, okay, they're, now they're all, like all flooding in. I'm trying to keep up. Um, a few interesting ones from earlier on. Did you find, uh, Leilani Olson Richmond asks, did you find that any of the women's views on their Jewishness or outlook on Judaism as a religion changed after the war? Yeah, it's a really good question and Funnily enough, no one I wrote about really wrote about that. And I think partly it's because I was generally writing about Jews from secular socialist movements. And so they, the, the religious element of their experience, they, many of them were not religious. Um, some of them were completely assimilated and they would talk about how that, that was even difficult for them and they had to you know, find a way into the youth movement because they were so assimilated. Um, so I, I wasn't writing about characters who were particularly um, thinking about their religious identity. So it, it's not something that came up. Also, most of what I was looking at was you know, really stories of, of what they did in the, it, it did, no, the answer is no, it didn't really come up. Okay, um, it's quite a long question um, here from Tanish Babel, um, who says, thank you so much for being here. Your words and body of research are not only inspirational, but also insightful. I cannot wait to read the book. I had a question regarding your writing process. I'm compiling research on a woman during the Holocaust who risked her life trying to hide her Jewish colleague. However, I've been not been able to find some key details about her life. So my question is, when you are not able to find all the details about the person you are writing about, how do you weave a story while still being true and respectful to the survivor and the es essence of her bold efforts? I mean, I worked with the details I had and I created narrative with the details that I had. I, I, I had a few characters, so sometimes I could feel, I could shift perspective to um, provide perhaps insight or a discussion from another perspective that may have filled in what I didn't have from another character. So sometimes working with more perspectives can help you fill out blank spots. Um, but I, 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 I didn't, I mean, I think there may be once or twice where I, in the book where I said, I have to say you, one could imagine that she did this. And I, I was so, I was so careful with that. My editor was like, oh, it sounds so tentative. And I was like, no, I can't, if this has to be true, I'm not going to say this happened. I, I ha, I, like, I, I just, my historical training, um, would not let me ever fictionalize. So. Uh, you know, I worked with what I had, but you can break that and say, you know, I don't know what the, what the voice or tone of your, of the piece is, but you can tell, we don't know this. This is what may have happened based on other characters who I've researched. Um, another question from Angela Franklin. Um, I commend you on the yeoman task you've completed. How in the world did you manage not to become buried in the minutiae of research and so much information? I'd love to know what you left out of the book. This is actually something that Nancy and I had talked about as we were preparing for the event too, like what didn't make it? I did get buried in the minutiae. <laughs> um, that, that, of course I got buried in the minutiae. Um, you know, certain questions I became very obsessed with and I, I spent a lot of time on it. And my editor was like, just leave it. I became very obsessed with 
money in the ghettos? How did Jews have money? What, how did money work? What was the value of things? How did they, how did the resist, they were always having money to buy weapons. Where's this money from? And I spent quite a bit of time trying to track that. And you'll see in the book, there's some footnotes around it where I went to, there's, there's no book on the money in the ghetto. Um, your original question was what, what got, what's on the cutting room floor? There is a chapter about humor in the Holocaust that didn't make it in. And I'm, it bothers me. Um, but it, 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 it was a negotiation and that got lost. Um, but I, you know, I found some amazing discussions and examples of the types of jokes in particular among women in, in the camps and, and in ghettos um, and, and men too, um, you know, incredible joke, lists of jokes and humor and, and as, a, as a form of resistance and rebellion. So that, that got cut. Um, and there, I mean, there's so many characters in the book, but there were about, you know, probably double that that I could have written about or that I did some research on and, and ended up getting cut. I originally had a lot more about Vilna and the women in the East and that had to get cut as well. Um, there's several variations of this question of how many of the women that you talk about survived or what percentage of the resistance fighters survived and whether you'll reveal that or they just need to read the book. You need to read the book. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't have a percentage number. I, I, I don't know. I, I compiled, I went through memoirs and testimonies and kept a list of every woman's name I came across. That's where the front pages of the book are from that list. Um, of women that were um, uh, involved in the organized resistance in Poland, Jewish women. And I came across hundreds and hundreds of names. I am only writing about, I'm writing about people who usually left robust enough testimonies or memoirs. So you, most of the people I write about survived because I was able to gather material, I was able to meet with families. I, I had, just as a historian, I had more data, I had more research, I had more juice from those stories. But as I explained, someone like Gusta Davidson left a diary that was found. Uh, Frumka didn't survive, but many people wrote about her. So, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know exactly how many women were in the underground. I can tell you it was definitely in the hundreds, if not thousands. Um, what percent survived? I, I don't know. I can tell you that out of 330,000 Jews in Poland, 300,000 survived. Um, I can also tell you that right now, every day I'm getting emails from people about, you know, you know, my great aunt was part of the Warsaw Ghetto Underground. She worked in the hospital. She never talked about it. Do you know about her? My cousin was on a bus with explosives and it was blown up. Do you, do you know about her? I have another story. Can I send you this? So uh, it keeps growing. So I, 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 can't, I can't give definitive statistics. Most people were killed. Most Jews in Poland were killed. Um, so I think the, the last, you know, kind of the best way to end the conversation is uh, maybe uh, if, what's next? What, where, where do you go from here? Where do I go from here? Tell me. <laughs> um, opinions in the Q and A, people think that they want to see the humor thing written out. There should be, you know, other books about resistance. There's lots of inspiration. There. I'm writing it down. Um, you know, what's interesting is that there are so many, you know, we, not, you know, even when I started this, I'm going to write another book about the Holocaust. Hasn't everything been written? But every book that I needed, <laughs> for not every book, but it didn't exist. I came across so, I mean, there's so many more books about the resistance that could be written. This resistance in all over Europe. This is just Poland. There's so many more towns. There's so many more people. You know, the, the story of money in the Holocaust. There's no book on that. I'm obsessed now, as you can see, with the 1930s. There's an amazing period of Jewish, a golden era for Jewish culture in mm -hmm. Poland. Um, totally under discussed, you know, eclipsed by what happened after. But, you know, I, I, I there, there are so many things that have come up and I, 
I, I, I, and then part of me just wants to move away from this altogether for a while and just write humor for a little bit and let myself decompress from such intensive kind of work. So I don't know, I'll keep you posted. <laughs> Well, I would like to um, thank you for your time and thank Nancy for so graciously and, and, and assiduously preparing for this lovely conversation. It was a pleasure for all of us to be able to hear more about the book, whether you've read it or not. I had read the book and hearing more about it just made me want to go back and read some more. Um, we will uh, kind of conclude the conversation by sharing. I'll drop a link into the chat uh, where you can purchase the book from Chevaliers um, and by thanking uh, Writer's Block for convening this and for Holocaust Museum LA for joining us um, for this wonderful event. And everyone who has RSVP'd, will, we will send a recording out. There's been some question about that. So look forward to that in the next 24 to 48 hours and we will see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. This was great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughtful questions.